My name's Luke. I'm a staff engineer at Brandwatch, which is a uh, social media insights company based in Brighton. Um, tonight, we're going to have a little bit of a learn about Quarkus, which is an up and coming framework in the Java world. Uh, I sit on uh, one of the conference panels and literally, I don't know, Steve, what, about 20% of our submissions have been something to do with Quarkus this year. Yeah, um, I thought that's so, one of the titles, isn't it? Something to do with Quarkus. Yeah. <laughs> well, something similar like that, yes. Yeah, so it's looking to be a real uh, up-and-coming uh, force within the Java world. So it's great everyone here tonight uh, learn something new that uh, perhaps is going to be uh, the, the next big thing. Um, so uh, I'm going to hand over briefly before we start to Steve Rackley, who is uh, part of Silicon Brighton. He's going to tell you a little bit about what they do, uh, and then we'll head on to the speakers. Oh, cheers, Luke, and, uh, and hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, just, just following on from Luke, I just want to say a massive thanks to everyone for joining us today. Uh, all of us at Silicon Brighton, we're absolutely stoked to be partnering up with Brighton Java, uh, one of Brighton's most long-standing meetups, and to welcome the Quarkus World Tour to Brighton. Uh, Steve and George, so awesome of you to come along and provide us with so much of your time. So thanks again, gents. If it's okay, I'm just going to give just a little bit of background uh, for those of, you, those of you new to Silicon Brighton. Uh, we are a community-led initiative to support digital growth across the South Coast. Uh, we began back in late 2019 by working with local tech groups to help raise their profile, and provide individuals just like everyone here with free opportunities for networking, training, upskilling and development to try and help everyone benefit through the sharing of expertise and the forming of new connections and partnerships. Uh, to date, we've run and supported over 90 events and we've given a platform to hundreds of speakers to share their knowledge. Uh, I hope everyone enjoys today's session and I'd just like to say we're really keen to hear from anyone watching who'd like to explore how they can contribute to Silicon Brighton, whether that's speaking at an event or helping with a technical workshop or even starting your own meetup group. Just head along to our website at siliconbrighton.com and from there you can join our community hub, reach out to me, Kieran, Kirsty, any other team. That's enough from me. Uh, thanks again, Luke, for today. And uh, yeah, back to you, mate. All right, thanks, Steve. And just to, uh, if you've not been before, a little bit about Brighton Java. Uh, we are one of the larger uh, Brighton, uh, one of the larger Java community groups in the UK. Uh, we were set up uh, about 10, 15 years ago, I think, by uh, by another guy called James, and we uh, provide community-centric meetups. So we are all about just connecting developers together, talking about new tech and just uh, getting to know your fellow developers in the Brighton area and just sort of keeping the, the community alive down here on the South Coast. So before I hand over to our speakers for tonight, just a quick little bit of housekeeping for you. We are recording this, uh, this evening's session. So if you don't wish to appear within the recording, uh, make sure you turn off your webcam. If you have questions, uh, this is very much an interactive event. We're gonna be sort of guiding a lot of the, uh, the later parts of this evening with, with your feedback. So pop your questions in the chat. We've got Kirsty, our wonderful moderator, who will be keeping an eye on that and uh, making sure that your questions get answered. You can also raise your hand using the reaction feature in Zoom uh, if you do want to speak rather than type, uh, and we'll get around to you for those questions. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Steve and George, who are our presenters for this evening. They're from Red Hat, and they're going to guide you through the wonderful world of Quarkus. Thank you. So uh, I should be very clear if I expect you all to be very nice because if you're very nice, you can get a t-shirt like mine, okay? And being very nice means ask us questions. Um, Georges, who will do the, the little bit more introduction in a second, Georges thrives on technical challenges. Don't you, Georges? You'd love being asked how to do something in Quarkus in the last 30 seconds. Yeah, 30 seconds, that's, that's plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, right. So I'm gonna let me start. I've got some slides. So then we'll talk about how this day's this thing's gonna run. Uh, right. So as always, there we go. 
Right, so you can see my slide, Quarkus World Tour? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. So thank you as always to, in this case, Brighton for hosting us. As you gather, we're a world tour. We are going round user groups virtually, and maybe even later in the year, we'll do it physically. And we're going around and we're doing what we're doing with you here, which is showing you Quarkus in action and giving the opportunity to ask us some questions about Quarkus. Uh, this is, I was trying to figure this out, I think this is number 30. You are the 30th user group that we visited and we have many more to come. So, you know, there are many recordings out there which are very similar to this one. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, we'll do a quick intro in a second. Uh, I've got some slides just to give you a sense of what Caucus is and why it exists. And then George is going to do some demos, then we'll do some more slides, etc. But mostly this is a code jam, which means uh, we'll show you stuff, but if you ask us questions and we can show you the answer by piece of code, we'll do that. So we'll go down the rabbit holes that you want. Otherwise you'll get what we think you'll be interested in. So, you know, do shout out and we'll see where we can go. Okay. so. You've got me, Steve Poole. Uh, so I'm in the UK. Um, I am the Quarkus community manager at Red Hat. And so my job is sort of introducing all this sort of stuff and give you some overview. But all the heavy lifting is done by my colleague, Georges, who can now introduce himself. Do you want to introduce Hi. yourself? Hey, folks. Yeah. Um, you just call me George. Uh uh, that's the English translation of my name. Uh, so I'm a Greek American software engineer uh, working at Red Hat. I've been working for um, on Quarkus for the past couple of years. So yeah, and it's been a great opportunity to uh, with Steve to go out to to these meetups and show you folks like uh, what Quarkus is. And I, I was really um, excited to hear from the couple of folks that uh, spoke up earlier that they don't know about Quarkus. Um, they've heard of it and that, that's the kind of, uh, audience we're targeting, right? People that have not used it, but have like heard of it and they're thinking, oh, maybe this is cool. Maybe this is great for my next project. And that's what we'll try to show you. Um, like why we think uh, Quarker should be the yeah. framework to use instead of like more established frameworks, uh, for your next project. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so at the bottom of all, I think almost all the slides are some Twitter handles. So. If you don't get you wanted what you wanted today, then just reach out and ask us. The Quarkus IO one, of course, is the main one, and then there's more minor Georges. Okay, um, you are on stage. Please ask us questions, and if we don't get them during the chat, we'll try and get to them at the end. As I said, it is completely driven by what you ask us. Right. Uh, yes, and if you want. If this sparks your interest and you go, this is really cool, but we'd like to know more, then just talk to Luke and others and just say, can you come back and tell us about something more that you heard? Because obviously we're more than happy to come back and give you some deeper dives, hands on, those sorts of things. Right, so what I my experience is, is that pretty much every Java developer has heard of the word Quarkus, but quite a few don't know what it is, hence why we're here. Right. So how, why does Quarkus exist? Well, Quarkus exists because of different ways of thinking about the problems that we have as Java developers. And uh, there are three groups of challenges that we have. There's performance, which is the way that you designed your applications, the way that works when you try to take that and move it into a cloud environment or a Kubernetes environment, whatever one you happen to be touching, the chances are that the performance structure that you have doesn't work in the new environment. And so you're having to learn how to code and redesign applications to give you performance that works well in a cloud environment. Uh, the environment itself is changing. So not only are we, are, as Java developers, are we being asked to look after existing applications, we're also being asked to create Java applications that run in their cloud, whatever that may be. And we're also being asked to run, write Java applications that may be run as serverless 
or run on the edge, all over the places. So the environments that Java developers have to deal with has, has multiplied which is you know, awesome for Java, but challenging for us as developers. And then the third one, which is probably the one that I hear the most of is that businesses are saying to developers, you just got to do it quite faster. You know, we, time to value is the critical element for so much of what we do. So these are things that challenge us and Quarkus helps you with these problems by taking a different view of how to solve them. So Quarkus is going to do these things. It's going to make your code Kubernetes aware. Well, not knowing so much your code, but it's going to help you run your code in a Kubernetes environment much easier than maybe you can, than you've seen before, which is obviously important if you're running stuff in the cloud, you don't want to be having to deal with all the nasty edges of how to deploy things to Kubernetes and how to configure things and deal with secrets and all that stuff. Wouldn't it be good if you could just have that taken care of, taken care of for you. Quarkus is going to help you with situations where, from a performance point of view, you want to get the maximum out of it because you have a performance profile, maybe you're doing microservices or something, or even serverless, and you know that you would get just a bit better performance or improve your economics if you could go straight to native. So Quarkus is really helpful to you if if you're looking at producing Java applications that you can compile to native. Because those of you who've ever tried Graal will know that there are some sharp edges and Quarkus will help you with them. And then you can see the other two. So reducing performance overheads. Yeah, wait and see what we've got for you and you'll see that it can help you with just the performance in so many ways. And because the Quarkus team have thought so much about how you as a Java developer um, work and what could we do to help you be more productive there's a bunch of stuff which we'll show you that makes you even more productive and especially cloud environment and a whole bunch more right so excuse me right so from a performance point of view Quarkus is, is container first and the reason that is um is because it turns out if you do all the performance measurements that we've all done over the years, it turns out that if you can tune your application and your runtime to consider that it's running in the, these um, constrained environments, that tuning that way, uh, having an application that works well in that environment gives you dividends if you don't run it in that environment. So if you run it, um, if you take your application, make it container, uh, design it to run in a container, then if you don't run a container, you run it on bare metal or whatever, you still get loads of benefits. So Quarkus looks at things as saying, we assume that you're running in these environments. So that's why we say Quarkus is Kubernetes native. We don't really talk about cloud native because honestly, cloud native is a bit too fluffy, if I can use that word. Cloud native is a term that's grown up over the years and it encompasses all sorts of interesting things. But actually, if you tune for cloud native, you might find you're tuning for, I don't know, um, a cloud foundry environment or whatever. And if you do that, you'll then find that if you try and take those applications and move them to somewhere else in the cloud space, you'll find it doesn't work. So again, we try to look at creating things that are focused on Kubernetes, because A, that's pretty much where so many of us are going. But also if you do that, then it works well everywhere else. So, you know, two wins. And there's my performance chart. That's the only one you're going to see because you're, as, as when George does in his demos, you'll see that performance is self-evident. There are two sets of charts here. The top two are about how much memory you consume. And then the, the one below that, boot plus first response time, is, is literally startup time. So, the first two at the top, two different examples, I think you'll find that in general, you'll get this sort of performance pattern for any Java application, because what Quarkus is doing is changing fundamentally the way that applications are constructed. And a lot of this is based on those sorts of new ideas. So you can see that if you take the gray box, it's some, what might be considered to be a traditional application. 
and just switching the framework to be Quarkus and running with a standard JVM. So no magic JVMs in this, it's just Quarkus and your standard JVM, you will get good memory improvements. And then if you really want to, and you don't have to, but if you really want to, you can compile to native and get the really tiny memory consumption. And you can see the same on, you know, there's two benchmarks there. Then the boot time one, startup, same sort of thing. Uh, if you take your standard application, it usually takes some seconds to start up. So just by switching to Quarkus and using the standard JVM, you get substantial reductions in startup time. And if you then go the final step and then compile to native, you can get you know, really, really fast startup times. So if you're looking at Java in serverless environments, then this could be, you know, Quarkus is definitely a good, a good choice. Now, one of the things we'll point out now is Quarkus is not designed to be just a compiled to native tool. That's not what it's about. But we enable you to do it much better than um, if you try to do it yourself using Gra directly. It's your choice based on the performance that you need as to whether you need to do that. Right. So there we go. Uh, performance is awesome, of course. Uh, and you can read the words, but basically we're really good at helping you reduce your memory consumption. We're helping you get really fast startup. It means we can give you um, improved density, which means you can get more out of the CPUs that you're buying on the cloud than your traditional environments. Okay, so how is this possible? Ha! Huh. How does, where does all this magic come from? Well, before we answer that, I'm gonna hand over to George to do the first of the wow demos. So bear with me while I now find my mouth so I can press stop sharing. There we go. Okay, George, over to you. Excellent, thank you, thank you, Steve. Um, so uh, the reason Steve stopped at this point is because apart from the amazing performance Quarkus has, is that it has another uh, very, it, it emphasizes a very important point and that is developer experience. So we really want you as developers that use Quarkus uh, to be able to uh, use it extremely easily and be very, very productive uh, when you're using it. So uh, when it comes to that, what I wanna show in this first demo is how easily you can create code, you can update your code, and how, how fast the, the development cycle is, right? And how fast and how easy it is. So let's uh, start. Uh, basically I have a project here that is generated from our uh, project generator, which is code.quarkus.io. Uh, this is the website we have where you can um, select a whole bunch of options depending on what kind of application you want. Uh, this generates a project for you. Um, I'm not gonna, there's so many options here, so I'm not gonna go through them, I'm just gonna, take the ready-made project that I already have here. Um, and I'm going to start it in what we call the development mode, right? So uh, what we envision the developer experience being when you're, when you're actively developing the application is that uh, you launch this dev mode and then you go straight to coding, right? Straight to implementing uh, the business logic that you hope will bring uh, users and revenue to your application, right? So let's start with something like extremely simple. Uh, what I have here is a um, application that will simply respond uh, hello when we hit it with uh, localhost hello with an HTTP GET, right? Uh, so these annotations here are JAXRS annotations. Uh, so Quarkus implements a whole bunch of um, specs and uh, uses a whole bunch of libraries, and uh, JAXRS is our preferred um, REST layer. So um, I've launched the dev mode here, and now I'm going to hit um, hello, right? I hit the hello endpoint and that just works, right? So obviously there's nothing nothing super here. Uh, all I'm doing is returning hello. But uh, now this is where the Quarkus magic happens, right? So I'm just, I edit code, I refresh, and I automatically see that change reflected onto the browser. Now, uh, you might be thinking, well, I might've configured a bunch of things earlier. I might be doing some tricks in the background. And I assure you that uh, this change that I made in the IDE, I could have made anywhere, right? Could have made from Vim. I could have made from us, uh, from said or whatever. Anything goes, right? Because 
oh, with this Quarkus dev mode, there is no setup, right? There's absolutely nothing you need to configure uh, for this uh, hot re reload of code to, to happen. So I make more changes and that just works, right? Uh, so keep this in mind, right? You launch the dev mode, you never restart the application, you never have to do anything else. All you have to do is just edit your code and everything is uh, reflected on screen. Um, so now you might be thinking, well, yeah, that's that's definitely awesome. But maybe maybe it's limited to just like a method body because all I did here was change the method body, right? Um, well, let's take that a step further. And let's add a second endpoint. And we'll say path two. And we'll say hello two. And I'll hit this. And I'll get hello two, right? Because now I added a new method here. And uh, it was automatically picked up. And not only was it automatically picked up, it happened just so fast. It was like right when I coded, I refreshed in the browser, everything just happened, right? So I, I'm never waiting uh, for anything. And of course, it's not limited to anything like this, right? Because um, we can make this, we can make arbitrarily complex changes. Uh, let's say default value. Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say hello uh, name. And I'm going to hit hello two, and I'm going to get hello world, right? Uh, so what I'm showing you here is that the, the development cycle is that you continue to update your code in any manner you like, and everything just works. Uh, for example, if I make a Java syntax error and I refresh here, I get that error uh, right in my browser, right? So I, I don't have to leave uh, the browser IDE environment at all. I make I um, fix it, everything just goes back to working. Um, and now let's take it a step further. Let's say we want to uh, move out, we want to introduce uh, some more complexity into the application. So I'm going to add a business logic class. I'm going to call this a greeting service, right? Uh, so this is going to be a CDI bean. Uh, so for those who have not used CDI, um, it's very, very, very similar to Spring Dependency Injection. Uh, the annotations have different names, but essentially it's the exact same thing. Uh, so singleton here would be um, a singleton in spring as well. And what I want to do here is that I want to move the business logic of greeting into this service, right? So I'm going to say greet string name. I'm going to say hi name, name, excellent. And then I'm going to go here. I'm going to add greeting service. I'm going to inject this, right? So I'm injecting the service, which is a singleton bean. I'm injecting it into the JAXRS resource. I don't need to add any um, annotations here because there's a single constructor. So Quarkus knows how to uh, resolve this. And let's say we go here and we say greeting service greet name. And I refresh. And I get high world. So everything I'm doing, I'm just coding, coding, and coding, refreshing, seeing everything uh, working, and that's just uh, that's just amazing. But um, I might want to take it a step further and say, hmm, okay, cool, I can make any Java change I want, but um, what about configuration, right? Um, I might not want this to be like hard coded inside my code. I might want to pass it as a configuration value. And uh, Quarkus can obviously do that. So uh, let's call this prefix. Let's add a constructor. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna use um, the micro profile. Um, we're using micro profile config specification. Uh, so micro profile, uh, you can think of it as a set of uh, small specifications that address various um, various needs that cloud native applications have, right? So in this case, it's configuration. I want the configuration uh, to come externally in, uh, from somewhere where it could be a property, it could be a system proper, it could be an app from application properties, it can be system property, environment variable, it doesn't matter. Uh, this is an abstraction that tells me where the, that tells me which uh, property to inject. So I'll go here and I'll say prefix and I'll also, let's say add this as well and I'll refresh but this time I got an error, right? So um, I thought everything went well. I was feeling good about myself, but Quarkus tells me, you know what? You jumped a step, you made a mistake. And it tells me very in the environment where I expected it to see it, right? I expected to see it in the browser. That's what I wanted to see when I refreshed. I didn't want to see the errors like tucked into the uh, IDE console somewhere. And it tells me that 
uh, you know what? The greeting prefix property is missing. So uh, true to the um, live reload nature of Quarkus, all I have to do is go here is into the um, application properties that Quarkus um, reads automatically. I'll say greeting prefix, hey, I'll refresh and everything just works, right? Uh, so ponder that for, for a little while, right? I, I never restarted the application. I didn't do anything. All I did was ran uh, MVN Quarkus dev here in the beginning, right? Uh, where was it? It was right here, MVN Quarkus dev. And then all I did was I went through a cycle of coding and refreshing in the browser. Uh, so that's the, the first part of what we really uh, want you to take away from the developer joy of Quarkus is that uh, you can make arbitrary changes and Quarkus just applies them so quickly. As fast as you can code, then uh, Quarkus will um, reflect your changes onto the live application. And I think, yeah, that's the end of the first part, right? Yeah. I, as I said, every time I see that, I go, wow. That's just, magic. Just, that's you magic. think yeah. um, you opt the you're allowed updating of the POM as well, can't you? You can change the POM and it'll update. Yes, yes. If you update, yeah. you can add dependencies to the POM here. So let's say I would like add, um, let me add. Are you not sharing? Oh, sorry. You're not, you're not showing. Yes, that's right. a good point. Well, let me share that again. It sounds good though. <laughs> so yeah, right. let's say I went to the POM here, right? So I've, I haven't refreshed, um, but Quark is, um, yeah, now I made a mistake. So let's say, well, I made a mistake. So when it, lo when it looks for changes in the palm, the changes need to uh, be valid, right? Uh, so let's say I will add something here. Uh, I'll say JSON B and it'll pick up the change. It will download this uh, because I haven't downloaded it before and the application is ready, right? I take it away and the application is ready again, right? It's just ready to go. Um, don't worry about this part at the bottom. We'll explain it later. It's another part of the Quarkus developer experience magic. Uh, but that's the point that you can change anything, including the POM XML, and um, your application will uh, continue to, to function, right? Yeah, cool. Right, thank you. Uh so I've got some more charts and then we'll do, because to explain to you, explain how this high level was going on here. And then we'll go back to more demos and uh, we'll deal with any questions that we have as they come up. So let me go back to showing my slides. Okay. Get the mouse in the right place. Oh, okay. So yeah, so developer joy. You just seen it in action, or well, you seen part of it in action anyway. Um, the thing I could say about Quarkus is that the engineering team value your experience in using the tools as much as they value so, uh, giving you the, the technical things that you need. And it's it's there. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So you can see why we talk about it as being supersonic Java, because it is, it's fast from performance-wise, but as a developer, you just you just write code, right? And to be honest, you don't need to have a fancy IDE. You can do this with Vi if you want. I mean, you know, fancy IDs are better, but it's it's all there. Right. So how do we do this? Okay. Well, obviously, we take out everything that you don't need. We take out all the bad, I mean, unnecessary code, right? Because it turns out that there's lots of stuff that your application does that is unnecessary, and we can take a different look at things. Right. So bear with me. With, as we go through this, because you sort of, I want to set the scene. So this is the graph of a traditional benchmark, which mirrors the, the shape of a traditional application. So modern applications, modern applications, traditional applications would trade off startup time for maximum throughput. So you would let you, you are happy, we're happy to let an application take a some time to get to the point where it could actually run at full power. And as part of that, there was also some extra cost. So the red line is throughput, how good your application is at responding to workload. And the white line is how much memory does it take to get, to get that to happen. And if you've, um, 
if you look at any Java benchmarks, you will see this shape quite often. And what it tells you is, is that over it takes some time to get to the point where you've got maximum throughput. And you probably had to use more memory than you really needed to from an application point of view to get started because you have all these processes going on, like jitting and stuff like that. Right. So modern cloud applications don't want to look like that. They want to look like this. They don't want peaks and peaks above the line because if you're buying resource, um, you know, you're buying you know, Amazon resource, you don't want to go have to go to the next tier to just get your application to start if you're never going to use that memory again. So you want to have really good memory management as low as possible and as obviously to start up as fast as possible because you want that application to be doing dealing with the workload. You don't want to wait around. Right? So when you take, when you look at what's going on in the, the in Java startup, application startup, there's a the reason that you have this shape is because the JVM is using the CPU that you should use your application to get everything ready. You know, it's, it's doing a whole bunch of initialization code, initialization of the application. It's initializing the JVM. It's doing a whole bunch of compilation of taking your class load, class files and turning it into machine code, right? It's spending your CPU and your memory that you've bought to get to the point your applicate to make your application ready to go. And that's what we've been, that's what we've lived with because it didn't really matter. But obviously nowadays this shape is not good at, is not good and we need to change it. So the way that you we the way that we look at turning one shape into another is to think differently about what happens when. So in a traditional space, there's obviously things that happen at build time and there are things that happen at runtime. So what happens at build time in a traditional application is well, you compile things and you produce class files. And that's it. Maybe you produce a job, but that's all you do. And then at runtime, your code kicks off and the application gets initialized, the, the VM gets initialized, there's a whole bunch of duty going on, and somewhere in there's your app. So what Quarkus does is says, mm, there's a different way of thinking about this. So what Quarkus says is, what about we look at all the places where you do stuff at runtime that could actually be done at build time? What could we move left to allow you to do things at build time where obviously it's, it's not costing you runtime costs to actually give you that shape? Because obviously everything that flattens that curve that we can take out will give you benefit. Uh, so the, the only catch is that lots of the uh, initialization that goes on is very dynamic. What classes should I load? Um, you know, what's on your class path? What reflection is it? Have you got to do what cert? You may have service loaders, all sorts of stuff where it's uh, not until you actually launch the application do you know what the answer is. Well, at least that was the theory. And one of the reasons that this is complicated is because Graal, in, if you've looked at Graal, Graal has no truck. With, with dynamism because it's going to turn your code from classes into machine code. So it has to work out what the answer is going to be. So there is a catch and the catch is if you want to go all the way down to using Graal, you've got to figure out how to deal with the, these, these challenges. And the other catch uh, again is if you decide you're not going to do any jitting, which is a reasonable choice, but if you do make that choice, then the re-optimization that JITs do when you run your application over a, long over a long period of time, that jitting doesn't take place. So therefore your application doesn't necessarily get maximum capacity, maximum throughput, but that may be the right choice for you because you may not want to wait around to get to the point where you've got that benefit. So you may want to cut your losses and just go straight to native and get much better performance, but not necessarily um, the highest throughput that you can get over time. So Graal is uh, amazing tech and it's an integral part of what 
quarkers will offer you. Uh, what quarkers, or well, the way that quarkers works when it's designed means that quite often, or in my experience, pretty 100%, you can take your Java code that's quarkified, um, and out of that, you can then go to the next step, which we'll demo, I'm sure, uh, and create uh, native, native code. And the challenge is that Graal has all these sharp edges because it says there's a bunch of stuff that, that you, you're doing in Java that it doesn't like, lots of reflection stuff, and they need to be dealt with. And if you do it by yourself, it's horrible. What Quarkus will give you is just a much nicer experience. So another complicated chart, but let me just take you through the bits and you'll get a sense of what's going on here. So above the line, standard JVM, there's build time stuff, you know, generation, maybe some initialization, but mostly it's all at runtime. Uh, and the Graal, the Graal thing, Graal thing says, well, we want to do everything up front at build time because we need to do that. And what Graal actually does do is it will actually run some of your static initializers and work out what the answer is going to be, and then you end up compiling those into native code. So what Quarkus gives you is the choice of going down both routes, because the way what we're basically doing is looking at all the reasons why your application startup is challenging and saying, what can we do to move that into the build time? And every single one of those that we do by moving initializing, initialization or uh, improved generation, moving it into build time means it doesn't happen at runtime, but it also means that we've solved the problem for Graal paths as well. So Quarkus gives you the choice about whether you want to compile to native or not, but either way you get this enormous benefit from the fact that we're taking a different look at the way that the application, application should be started and run. Okay, I think I said that, yeah. And there's a bunch of stuff we can do because we can just look at the Java code and go, well, we understand what, it, what you're trying to do because it's generic, but actually if we can enhance that thinking with extensions, and you'll see Quarkus has lots of extensions, where we're adding to the smarts. So if we know more about how your application uh, is configured, what it's using, then we understand that if you're using Spring, you're doing things in certain ways, we can work out what that means and we can help you give you, give you that experience. So you saw George doing that dynamic, you know, continuous code changing. A lot of that is driven off the smarts that we plugged in. And if he was to plug in some Spring stuff, it would be driven off the spring extensions, which has, you know, creates the smarts. So this gets interesting because once you've got this separation of, of understanding, then those development cycles that we're used to can start to change. So this is a traditional one. <clears throat> you know, you have code on your desk, you have a dev time thing, you make code changes, you then compile it at build time and then you run it. And, you know, you go around that loop over again and it's slow. Well, what you've seen from George is we've been added this dev mode thing in the middle between build time and runtime, right? Which runs on the same JVM. And bear in mind, this is dev mode. This is not production, right? Don't do this in production during dev mode. And because again, we've got understanding of what your application is trying to do, and we've got these extra these smarts, we can add that into the dev mode thing, that's where the regen comes from, because we understand a lot more about what your application is trying to do, right? And that means that you can have this really fast cycle, you change source code, you skip build time because dev mode knows what to do. Now, the interesting thing is, is that you saw that happening just now, but it doesn't really matter where the JVM is. So you can do this mode if the JVM that you've just launched is running a container on, on Docker on your laptop. Or in fact, if it's running in a container that's running on Kubernetes. Think about that for a moment. Okay. So I do have to slide, but I'm gonna stop here because you have to think about this and we'll give you some more demos so that you can, you can get over it, um, get the concepts into your head. Quarkus thinks differently about how your application should behave in these environments and helps you make the transition from the code that you've got that works one way to working in this new environment. And it's pretty seamless, right? And then if you want to go to 
um, native, then Quarkus is there to help you do that because it just happens that the things we've done to give you the performance benefits and the developer joy are going to help you that space as well. So generally, even if you said, I'm not sure I want Quarkus because I don't want to run it on the cloud, but you wanted to do something that goes Java to native, you can use Graal or you can use Quarkus and you'll get a much better experience with Quarkus because Quarkus isn't just about applications. You, would, you can do command line tools, you name it, Quarkus does it for you. Okay, I'm gonna stop speaking because you don't really want to hear me speaking. You want to see the maestro do his thing. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Have I set you up there? Uh, oh, on, totally. Yeah. <laughs> cool. I don't know. I don't know if you set the expectations too high, though. <laughs> no, no, no. I definitely didn't. Yeah. Okay, so um, Steve mentioned that uh, you can take the application and launch it in the cloud and continue to get that uh, sort of. Um, awesome uh, edit code and see it reflected on the running application, right? And that's not just theoretical. Uh, we're gonna show how you do that uh, right now. So um, a bit of uh, setting things up here. What I have here, what you're seeing on my screen is an OpenShift console. So OpenShift is Red Hat's uh, enterprise um, distribution of Kubernetes. So think of this as just Kubernetes, um, and with, in this case, with an awesome uh, UI, right? Uh, so that's why I'm using it here. It's gonna, I'm gonna demonstrate how we can uh, uh, deploy the application to Kubernetes and also uh, have uh, the live reload we were talking about. Um, so this cluster is kind of slow. It's not close to where I am. Uh, so the deployment might take uh, a couple minutes. So um, let's start off with uh, what we're gonna do. Uh, basically, so uh, when you're deploying Kubernetes, right? First of all, you need to build a Docker container. And how do you build a Docker container in Quarkus? Well, it's super easy. Uh, like Steve said, we have extensions for everything. Uh, and we have an extension for building a Docker container. And it's this uh, extension here, this Quarkus container image Docker. What that will do is that once um, when we launch MVM package, um, after the jar is built, uh, we are going to use the, the Docker file here that is that Quarkus already provides when you generate an application. Uh, so you don't have to write this. So it will use this Docker file in order to create a Docker image, right? Uh, and once it does that, it will also generate Kubernetes manifests. And once those are generated, it will apply them to the cluster. Uh, so let's launch that now. So what I'm doing here, right? Uh, one command. MVN package, and then I'm adding this flag, which is Quarkus Kubernetes deploy true. So essentially we're telling Quarkus, you know what? Once you uh, create the jar, then you should also deploy Kubernetes. I'm adding the skip, I'm skipping the test here. Don't do this. Uh, I'm doing it because I didn't update the test when I updated the code and I don't wanna update the test at this point. So all I'm doing here is I'm telling Quarkus build the jar, then build the Docker file, which I see it's doing here, right? So it took this uh, Docker file, it ran through it. Uh, obviously this went super fast because I've done it before. So uh, there's a lot of uh, layering going on here. Now what it's doing is it's pushing this built Docker image to Quay, right? And I had configured in my application properties, I configured um, that I wanted to push to Quay.io, which is the container image registry. And I wanted to push it uh, to my uh, username, right? So I've already already logged in uh, with Docker login and that's why this can push. Uh, or I could have added the credentials here, but it doesn't really matter. I just um, wanted to show you that um, all the, the configuration that you could possibly need to build, uh, to build and push to a container registry is here, right? So now this is pushing the various layers. Uh, this takes a while because um, yeah, it uh, needs to, pu to push the various layers to Quay. And now that was done successfully. And once that is done, what it does here is that it generates um, in this uh, directory here, it generates this wonderful YAML file. So anyone who has worked with Kubernetes knows that the language of Kubernetes is YAML, right? You need to know YAML. You need to be able to sort through heaps of YAML in order to work with Kubernetes. But 
With Quarkus, that's a little different uh, because Quarkus, um, because it has all the knowledge of the, the application you're building, uh, like Steve mentioned, this is a, a closed world, right? Uh, so everything you add in the Palm XML and everything you configure here and you use in, in your application code, Quarkus knows about and can create the corresponding YAML. And that's what it does, right? It creates a YAML, it corresponds uh, completely to your application and it, it uh, uses, it creates a service and a deployment um, which uh, listen to the proper ports as well. And of course, it's using the, the container image that I um, specified. So what it did after it created this, not only did it create it, it applied it to the cluster that um, I'm targeting, right? So here I have this cluster uh, and now I have a pod that is running my application. So right, if this pod was created a minute ago, once I created it, once I um, applied the, the the command. Uh, this is a bunch of stuff here that you don't need to worry about because there's it's a bunch of warnings because I have a whole bunch of properties in the application properties file. Uh, so Quarkus tells you that you're setting something that you're not using uh, that could um, spare you from debugging. But in this case, it's not important. What is important is that uh, what you saw that with one command and very uh, two, three configuration file or configuration properties, I was able to take the application and run it on Kubernetes. Now on that on its own is pretty awesome, right? So this is the application. Um, this is hello from, uh, right, the hello endpoint. If I do two, I should get Hey world, excellent. So this, on this, on its own, this is amazing, right? There's like zero hassle deployment to Kubernetes. Uh, any Java developer knows that they don't want to deal with deploying to Kubernetes, right? Every Java developer says, just let me write some Java code and um, implement stuff. I don't want to deal with all this uh, DevOps stuff. I don't want to deal with production, but Quarkus makes it super easy because a lot of times you have to deal with it uh, so Quarkus gives you the ability to have a hassle-free experience, but that's not all, right? Um, earlier, I was changing code and that was re being reflected onto my running application. Well, uh, we can do the same here. What I need to do first, though, is I need to launch this remote dev mode. So remember earlier, it was called Quarkus dev. Now it's called Quarkus remote dev. And the, f the flag I'm passing in here is basically the URL of this application here, right? Uh, because this Quarkus can't know this. So you need to tell it like where the application is deployed. Uh, so that's exactly what I'm doing here with this flag. Now, um, Quarkus is now everything's just working perfectly like it was before. Uh, hello. But now I change code here. Let's say I change this, I refresh, and I should see this change reflected onto the cluster. And I do, right? And this is, th think about this, how, how magical this is. We took an app, a job application, we deployed it to Kubernetes with one command, and then we change code here on our, um, in our IDE, and we may, we just refresh the browser and those changes are reflected onto the running application. Now, now, um, Steve mentioned this before, don't do this in production. We do not um, envision this as, uh, as a, a way for you to um, automatically uh, update your applications in production. This is not the way to go. What we want this feature to be used as is that, um, say you're in a environment where you need to develop an application that depends on a bunch of services, but you can't run those services locally on your machine. Right. And perhaps you can't even connect to them outside of a specific uh, Kubernetes cluster. So what you need to do in, the, in that case is that you need to have your application um, connect to the services that are on the cluster. And the way we see this is that you can develop the application locally and have it applied to that dev or test cluster and everything just works uh, as if you were running locally, right? So if this cluster was local, uh, this refresh would be way, way faster than it, it. You saw it took a couple seconds here because the cluster is not close to me. Uh, if it were very close to me, then this refresh would be very, very fast. Yeah. And um, every time I see this, awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Not what you say, but you got it. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so, George, we have a question yes. um, from Jason. Um, 
uh, which is probably easier if you read it. The last yeah, okay. One because right, okay. So yeah. it says, can Quarkus also differentiate the layers, say the dependency level of the application without the need to find layers index? Yes, yes, exactly. So um, now there are. That's a very good question. Uh, in the 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 demo I did, right? It's not doing this, right? It's not doing this because uh, it's using a Docker file, and this Docker file. Uh, it, a Docker file isn't dynamic, right? It's a static thing that you have to update if there are any changes. But uh, Quarkus has another um, container image extension called container image jib, right? So for those of you who know, uh, jib is a open source library developed by Google that allows you to uh, build container images uh, in Java, right? Without the need uh, for Docker if you're just pushing. Uh, so what we do in Quarkus in this case is that we deeply integrate with Jib and we create the proper layers for you um, in order to uh, take advantage exactly of what you're talking about, the, the layering. So if you're cool. using contain Quarkus container image Jib, you get layering. If you're using regular Docker, then you have to set it up yourself. And, and how easy is it to switch from one to the other? Um, Basically, yeah, I wasn't sharing, so I'll share. Uh, basically, it was, I had this container image Docker. All I need to do is container image jib, and that's it, right? That That's the only change I need to make. Um, think, yeah, so I think that's one of the things that I like about Quarkus is um, it's, well, if you included it as a dependency, then you must want to use it. You know, yes, exactly, exactly. So bringing in the dependency means that a whole bunch of extra stuff are going to happen at build time in addition to what's going to happen at runtime, right? So yeah. Cool. Okay, well. So the question is, where do we want to go next? So more developer joy? I think so, yeah. I think uh, the, the testing stuff is really important. I think the testing, yeah, since you hinted at the beginning. Let's, let's do that and see if that strikes up any more conversations. Yes. Okay. So uh, let's go back to the initial thing, right? So the dev mode. So I launched Quarkus dev mode. And Check, what, share screen. Oh, share yeah. Screen. I've, yes, exactly. I forgot. Otherwise, we're trying to work it off the reflection of your forehead, and that never works. <laughs> yeah, and that probably won't work too well. <laughs> so I ran uh, MVN Quarkus dev, right? Uh, just like I had run on my first demo. And I said here, last time I said, forget about this, but now you get to remember about it. So it says, test, pause, press R to resume. What does this do? Let's press it. Now it's going, now I, I it's going to run in a mode where every change I make to the code will also run the corresponding tests, right? And now, because um, when I generated the project, a test was generated automatically, uh, it was for the hello endpoint. And because the hello endpoint um, is uh, changed, the test fails, right? Because it expects hello with one exclamation point. I'm actually saying hello with three. So if I change this, right, and um, run and do nothing else. So IntelliJ automatically saves files for me. That's the only thing that I that, is going on behind the scenes here. And after that, uh, what happens is that Quarkus will rerun the test, right? So let's say I have a, um, a second uh, test here that I'll say is for hello two, right? And now I added that test and I see that that one fails because obviously this uh, resource here wasn't returning it was returning, hey world, instead of hello, which I've added here. So if I go, hey world, then uh, Quarkus will rerun the test and they'll all pass, right? So this is, in my view, this is just plain amazing, right? Because let's say I create a test here as well. And I'll say, um, let's say, call this private, uh, greeting service system under test, new greeting service, yo, and oops, and let's go public void test, 
and I'll have a test annotation here and I'll say uh, assertions, assert equals system under test, greet uh, George and it should be equal to, I think, yo George, right? And let's see what happens. Yes, right? I, so I just added the test and Quarkus automatically ran it, right? So that is, in my mind, it's just plain mind blowing. It takes the, the developer joy to a whole nother level. So think about this, you write code and, and now in addition to you being able to see it in the browser when you invoke something, you also get your tests to run. All your tests are running uh, when you're changing stuff. So you change one part and it only runs the tests, the tests that are associated um, to that code, right? And of course you can um, pause that. So I could pause the tests. And now if I make a change here, uh, nothing will happen because I pause the test, but I run them again. Um, and yeah, it, um, it should have failed here. So this is, this looks like a bug, but if I run this, yeah, now it's failing, right? Because, uh, because the, the assertion is not correct. So if I fix the assertion, um, hey world, right. Okay, so there's obviously a bug here. Oh no, this is correct, sorry, this is correct. The other one isn't correct. Um, <laughs> sorry, yeah, that was my bad. I changed the wrong thing. Uh, hey world is actual hey world and it is let's see um, ah greeting service anyway um, the point is you make your changes and they are all reflected onto uh, both the tests and the running application right yeah yes so when you kick this off it runs Quarkus will run all the tests and then after that it's only going to run the tests that it knows are related to the changes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yes, that, that's exactly correct. The first time it has to run everything uh, to make these associations. Uh, but then each time you change code, it um, probes the associations and runs the corresponding test. So yeah, now I made the updates and everything's passing. Um, so if I add a new, new test, then it will run that test regardless and see um, which application code is uh, associated with that test. And um, it'll, each time a specific update happens, it'll run the, the test, right? Yep. Cool. Well, that's, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm on the, the right side of this, but, but I just love this. I just think it's great. It's just, especially when we're doing the right dev stuff, it's just really fantastic. Okay. Um, so there are other things we could talk about, or you could talk about. We could talk about the dev UI. Mm -hmm. We could talk about the native compilation of uh, the graph stuff because I'm sure people would be interested in that. Yes. Um, sure. Well. Um, do we have any questions well, in the chat or should I? Um... No, people just think it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's show the dev UI real quick, right? Um, yeah. Last thing, last very important thing for the developer experience. So we saw a reload with refresh. We saw reload of tests. Um, so the other super important thing that Quarkus has when it comes to developer uh, experience is that it has this UI console, right? So this UI is only available when you're running the dev mode. And what it does is that it gives you insight into the application. So there are various um, cards here that pretty much correspond to the extensions that are uh, available in the application. So for example, uh, configuration, right? Uh, when I open this, I see all the values that I've configured in my application. I can also change them, right? I can change all this stuff and uh, the changes will be reflected onto application properties. So let's say I change Quay here. Uh, I'll update this to Docker IO. And if uh, it's right here. And if I go to application properties, the change was made from Quay IO to uh, Docker IO, right? So this is a, a great way to see like all the, the, it doesn't only have your properties, it has all the effective properties uh, for the application, right? So there's a lot of stuff that Quarkus uh, configures implicitly uh, and you can change that from here uh, if you want to. Uh, now, what other stuff are there? For example, um, there's 
you know, you saw I configured uh, a couple of rest endpoints here, right? And in this uh, card here, we get to see uh, each endpoint, like um, where, where you can hit it and what it produces, what it consumes. And there's also a nothing to it. Uh, so it shows you that um, it's uh, the best possible way you could write uh, this REST, uh, you, REST API. What else is there? So I only have a few extensions in this application, but the more extensions I add, the more stuff uh, I could uh, I would see, right? So for example, if I had um, a liquid base, uh, you add fly in, wave. Sorry, go ahead. Could you add, yeah. add in the swagger stuff? Because I think that's quite cool. Right, yes, exactly. Swagger, good, good point, good point. Uh, so let's go Swagger UI, I think it's called. Um, Quarkus Swagger UI, right? Uh, so I'll refresh. And yeah, it took a couple seconds to, um, oh, right, I had to download the Swagger thing stuff. Um, and here, uh, in the dev UI, I should have seen Swagger somewhere, but maybe, uh, maybe it's um, open. Uh, open API. Sorry, open API. I think it's Quarkus Small Rye. Small Rye, open API. Yeah, this is the one I need. This is really the the one that will. Um, Bring me yes, and this is what brings me uh, the Swagger UI and the Open API definition. Uh, so uh, just by adding the extension, right, uh, Quarkus will automatically um, allow me to. It, it will automatically create the Open API schema that uh, that these REST um, API the REST endpoints I created correspond to. And this obviously you could share with a client to generate. Um, the, to, with someone else to generate the clients uh, or any other workflow you have. And of course, there's the Swagger UI, which you can use to test the application itself, test the the AP, the REST APIs themselves, right? Um, so let's go to this one, hello two, default world, try it out, hello, Steve, execute, and I get... Where's the response? Not accepted. Um, oh, it's, it's, yeah, this Swagger UI seems to have an issue here. It expects a JSON, but I can, I, I can work around this, I think. Yeah, uh, if I go here, produces media type um, text, text plane. Let's do this here too. Uh, refresh, and I'll go, Try it out again, Steve, execute. Hey, Steve, right? Okay, so basically, yeah, the, the Swagger UI was assuming a wrong type uh, for the, the media, the return to media type, but I could override it and just tell it explicitly what media type uh, I'm using. And um, I could use this console uh, this is the, the, the stock open API console configured for, for Quarkus uh, to, to test the, um, the APIs, right? And this is really important because, okay, with get requests, it's really easy to use them in a browser. But if you're doing post or delete or something like that, uh, you need an HTTP client to do that. And this uh, open API here um, allows you to, to, to yeah. invoke any REST API you've uh, written in your application. Yeah. So, I mean... The swagger thing is just shows Quarkus off because you add, you just put a new dependency in, you get those capabilities, and it's integrated. You make some changes, it all happens, everything gets regenerated. Ah, oh, good point. Yeah, let's um, let's add something, a new one, and make sure it's there. Hi name, right? And let's hit it, and it's there, right? Yeah. Cool. Okay, so we have some critics. We have some critics who are asking some interesting questions. Oh, cool. So Let's hear it. The first one is: Does the developer mode magic work with AWS EKS or AWS Lambda? 
Uh, you mean, I assume you mean to, um, like you have, you're, you're developing your Lambda locally and, uh, you want to like do the remote dev thing onto, um, uh, AWS itself and have that change reflected, right? I'm assuming that's, uh, yeah, that's what we're I'm talking about. And if that's the case, then no, it doesn't. This, this remote dev works specifically for Kubernetes. Uh, if we're talking about regular dev, like the, the Quarkus dev, um, and you've configured like AWS somehow to bring the request in to your server, then yes, it would work. Okay, but what about, you know, just generally cloud managed Kubernetes? It'll oh, any, there, any, Kubernetes, any Kubernetes would work because uh, I showed OpenShift, but this is just uh, Kubernetes behind the scenes, right? It's all yeah. Kubernetes. There's nothing OpenShift specific that I've done. So, uh, if you have an open, if you have a Kubernetes uh, cluster, then this remote dev thing will just work, right? Okay, cool. Right. So Luke says it's a long one. Um, he says all this magic is blowing my mind. But what <laughs> happens when I need to peek behind the curtain and change something the magic did for me? For instance, when I need to change the port my app runs on or I need to add a custom annotation to the Kubernetes YAML. Uh, it generates, uh, mm -hmm. it generates it for SSL termination, annotations on the KH Kubernetes ingress. Okay, so let's say, okay, the default port is 8080, right? And um, that's what I have here. But uh, if I go ahead and change the port to 9090, and I do MVN package, because, um, package is when these um, Kubernetes manifests are being generated. Then the port will get changed to uh, 9090. And this is what I was talking about when I was saying that uh, Quarkus, because it knows the entire environment, it can generate, it can, gen it can uh, tailor generate this uh, YAML to fit the application perfectly, right? And this is just the simplest case. Uh, there's uh, so many more things that could have been changed uh, that would reflect onto this here, right? And what the the one thing is this, right? Remember, we changed the other thing. We we changed the registry from Quayio to Dockerio, and that automatically got reflected here, right? So you see that right here. Um, now with Ingress, uh, if I add a property, I think it's called um, Quarkus Kubernetes. Expose, I think, expose true, and I regenerate. Um, I'm pretty sure that it, yes, it generates an ingress, right? And that ingress is configurable as well. Uh, so th there are properties that um, are Quarkus that, that apply to the whole Quarkus application that are reflected on the YAML, but there are also properties that are specific to the YAML. So you can change the YAML itself, right? So if I go to code quark, uh, not code, sorry. Um, I think quark is all config, all config. Um, there's a whole bunch of Kubernetes specific properties that I can use to customize uh, this YAML, right? Yeah, so there's all this stuff, the replicas, the node pork, image pool policy. So there's a huge list of stuff that you can uh, configure yeah. if you want to um, back out from uh, the defaults, right? So that's a, yeah. that's a general thing for Quarkus that uh, it makes a lot of choices for you, but there's almost always configuration uh, that'll allow you to uh, make a different choice if you so desire. But just to be clear, the, the, the YAML that gets generated, mm -hmm. that if you, if somebody edits that, mm -hmm. that will get out there, change will get over it. Yeah, because uh, basically this is generated in target, right? Uh, so each yeah. time uh, you invoke Maven package, uh, it'll get re, it'll get overridden. Yes. Okay, cool. Just because it's good to clear up. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so the other question was from Lee says, does the Swagger UI only work locally or does it work with remote dev as well? Remote dev, um, I'm almost certain it works with remote dev as well, yes. Um, I'm pretty certain I've seen it working with remote dev, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, there, there's no reason for it to not work, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, it, it'll work, it'll work, yeah. Okay, cool. 
Okay. I'm, I'm patting. You're doing all the hard work. Um, <laughs> let, let's do... Let's do the native stuff just to round mm -hmm. off the story so people can see what we promised performance and you can give them a little bit more insight. Good point. Yeah, excellent point. Uh, so um, Steve mentioned that like working with Crawl VM uh, on its own is difficult, right? I don't know if any of you have played around uh, trying to port your application to make it work with Crawl VM so you could run a native binary. Uh, that's not fun. It's not easy. Uh, but Quark is because it does all this stuff at build time and because it knows the entire, uh, let's say, class path and structure of your application, it can help GraalVM uh, build, like make the, the necessary configuration in order to build this uh, native binary. Now, you as a developer, um, in, if you're using Quark, extensions, you don't have to care about this at all, right? So uh, part of the work of the the extensions do is uh, configure Graal VM to be able to build the native binary for the target application. So as a developer, all you care about is when you would do package and um, you would do minus D native, right? So you're enabling a profile called native. And what that will do is that once the jar is built, um, uh, it will invoke the GraalVM native image binary. So I've already installed that, but you don't have to install that. Uh, Quarkus will use a uh, container image um, if you don't have it installed locally. So now what this does is that in Graal invokes GraalVM native image. Uh, this will take, a f uh, I think, about 40, 50 seconds on my machine, something like that. But as the application grows bigger, this could take a whole lot longer. And this, uh, this machine is very powerful. Uh, so... Um, Basically, yeah. the more CPUs and the more memory you give uh, Graal VM compiler, the faster it'll create your native binary. But the, the payoff is that once we get this native binary, um, which it did in uh, 45 seconds, 46, once we get this native binary, we can, let's see it first. Uh, it's in target. It's this application here. So it's a 46 megabyte binary. So this is a Rust application uh, that can handle JSON and, uh, and it also has a Swagger UI and everything. Uh, so this is 46 megabyte. The, 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 the important part is that when you run it, World Tour Runner, it started in nine milliseconds. Now think of that, nine milliseconds, right? And not only that, um, the, the amount of memory it takes to run is extremely small. So I have this uh, PSRSS alias here. So basically this is just a, an alias for that um, will allow me to, to see the resident set size, which is the total memory the application will take, the application takes up. Uh, so um, it the application itself now is uh, taking up 36 megabyte of RAM, right? Total. Uh, when I run this application as a native binary, it takes 36 megabyte. And if I hit it, um, I am at, no, nah, I'm 9090. I changed the port, right? No wonder it doesn't work. And it just works, right? Hello, hello. So think of that. That's a, we started from a job application um, with uh, REST APIs. And we compiled it down to native. It started in nine milliseconds and it took up 36 megabyte of RAM. So this is really where um, you could start using serverless uh, when you go down to this mode, right? Because if your application is starting so fast and it takes up so little memory, then you can have a huge density of uh, little tiny uh, serverless components that can respond instantly to um, increase the traffic, right? Yeah. And what I think is interesting with this is not only can you now use Java in places like Surface, but you can create native apps with them. And that means because it's so fast, you can use your Java skills to write native apps, you know, command line tools, um, you know, Java, Java operators. There's a whole bunch of stuff you could do that we used to do in Java many years ago, but it disappeared because Java just didn't go that way. And now we're giving you the opportunity to use Java in different ways, which is just awesome. Yeah. Cool. Thank yeah. you, George. Like, there's another question which mm -hmm. says, have you mated Quarkus with Java-based testing tools like JMeter, JUnit, and Selenium? 
Um, so, uh, J unit, the integration we have, uh, I showed you, uh, we integrate like very deeply with, um, J unit five. So this Quarkus test here is basically a, um, J unit extension. So J unit is totally covered. Uh, anything you do J unit, uh, works in uh, Quarkus. Uh, yeah. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that we do as well. So you have a, a native test. There's a native image test. Uh, so basically this runs the native binary um, and it tests that. There's the Quarkus integration test here, which basically runs whatever you built. So if I built a container image, it would run the container image. If I built a native binary, it would run the native binary. So it's a black box test that um, tests the final artifact of your application. Yeah. Um, what else? So can you, yeah. can you bring up your, can you share your screen and just show people what there is in the extensions list? Because uh, it's, we've just showed just a fraction of all the capabilities out there. Yes. Um, there is a whole set of other extensions. So the extensions mm -hmm. are being written by the Red Hat team. They're also being written by lots of the open source projects that you would recognize. Uh, and there's this long list and it continues to grow. There are hundreds of people contributing to this. But basically, if you want to get some of the smarts, so we, quite often with Quarkus, you can take your standard Java code and your standard dependencies and it'll still work quite well. But then you just get the extra if you just switch to the Quarkus enabled version mm -hmm. and you get all the extras. There's just a long list of stuff. <laughs> yeah, so anything... <laughs> Yeah, so anything, anything from like um, web protocols, so all the rest, GraphQL, gRPC, uh, to anything data related. So you have Hibernate, you have Mongo, uh, Redis, anything, all that stuff, with, all with reactive versions as well for for all these clients. Then you have uh, messaging, so Kafka, a very big part of the uh, Quarkus story. Um, then you have like. React, everything we do is reactive. So you can use reactive or non-reactive. Uh, we have both versions. Um, reactive is based on Vertex. So you can even go down to the Vertex layer if you want. Uh, there's a whole bunch of cloud stuff. So uh, we showed some of that. Um, observability. So when you're in production, it's extremely important to be able to observe what your application is doing. So we have like all this uh, tracing, metrics, logging, all that stuff. Security, obviously we didn't show anything here, but uh, security is super important for Quarkus. So we have a whole bunch of, we have a whole suite of uh, authorization authentication mechanisms. Uh, so basically there's just so much stuff here, right? Um, yeah. Compatibility. So like Steve mentioned briefly, uh, we have a compatibility layer for Spring APIs. So like Spring Dependency Injection or Spring Data or a Data JPA, for example, you can use. Uh, it's just so, so much stuff out there. Yeah. And there's not only all these extensions, there's also things that are Quarkus specific, you know, written by the Quarkus team. So things like Funky, which is this awesome thing. If you want to do serverless and you want to, you want to not be tied in to the back end, then look at Funky because you can write the code and deploy it to the back end of your choice just by switching your dependencies. It's just awesome. Um, Anyway, so what else? One more question. Uh, does Quarkus have something like Spring Cloud Config for when you're managing a whole fleet of services and you want to manage properties centrally? Uh, so this has two, um, two sides, right? Uh, we don't have a config server like Spring does, but uh, you can use... Uh, so Quarkus can talk to the Spring Cloud Config server same way as it can talk to, for example, Consul or um, Kubernetes Config Maps and Secrets. So, as a client, uh, Quarkus can you can leverage all these uh, centralized configuration me mechanisms uh, to configure itself, right? So, uh, so far there hasn't no one has actually written like take in the Spring Cloud Config server Quarkus, uh, but that, that, that doesn't matter, right? For as a Quarkus as an application, uh, you can just use the extension we have to talk to the Spring Cloud Config server. Cool. Okay. Are you exhausted? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. 
Okay. Well, um, and we're coming up on time. Um, thank you to your audience for being really engaging and asking good questions. Uh, as always, if you want to know more, well, you've got some Twitter handles you can reach out to. But of course, it's easy to find Quarkus. Just Google for Quarkus and hit the Quarkus.io website. Uh, there are lots of videos out there. There are lots of tutorials, guides, lots of people are interested in writing cool stuff. Uh, getting started is trivially, trivially easy. Um, and, you know, I think it just opens up a whole bunch of stuff that you might not have thought about doing before. Uh, so that's it, I think. Um, thank you, Luke and crew, for hosting. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll hand back to you. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Steve and George, for coming along today um, and showing us uh, just how much better life can be uh, than the spring slog. <laughs> As someone who's, I'm, I'm literally in the middle of writing a load of what you've shown today as spring extensions to, to help brand watch uh, dev quicker so uh, perhaps it's time to reconsider my choices <laughs> um, but yes thank you very much uh, as as i think steve uh, r and steve p alluded to earlier uh, we have got a bit of swag up for grabs today so uh, everyone on the call at the moment uh, i think uh, we're gonna contact you we've got 10 t-shirts to give away uh thanks to red hat so we will uh put all of your names that are on the call at the moment into a draw and we'll reach out to you via email uh using the emails you signed up to the event with and uh we'll get in contact if you've won about sending one of those t-shirts out but with that is there anything else you wanted to uh mention at the end here steve i think there was some other upcoming events for silicon brighton you wanted to uh, oh. Where we are doing this on a regular basis, you can imagine. In fact, we're doing another Quarkus World Tour later today. Well, we're not, but other people are. <laughs> in New um, just to remind everybody, um, you know, this is a real taster. But if you really want to know more, then you know, talk to Luke and see what we can, and then see what we can do to come back and do something more detailed. And maybe, depending on time scales, we may be able to do it in person. That yeah. would be cool, we are we are looking forward to getting everyone back in a room and seeing everyone's lovely faces and sharing some pizza and beer again in the future so yeah um do do reach out to me on meetup um and if you've got any more questions what you'd like to see for round two uh and uh, yeah we'd love to have you back cool uh i'm just gonna hand over to steve r who's gonna chat a little bit about what else is coming up on the silicon brighton calendar thanks luke just realised I'm flying a little bit. I'm just loading up a Trello board. I'm, uh, yes, feel like a little bit, uh, yeah, without my prompt deck, I'm not exactly sure where I'm coming or going. Uh, what have we got coming up? Uh, ah, yeah, Brighton Kotlin in a couple of days, if you can join us for that. So, uh, Leeds, Leeds here on the call, actually, we've got three top speakers. So, uh, yeah. Really brilliant meetup if you can come along. Uh, that's 6 till 8 p.m. Uh, and what else do I want to talk about? Got a few bits and pieces coming up in July, but yeah, I think for the audience here, uh, this Thursday, 6 till 8 p.m., we've got three three coming along for uh, for Brian and Cotton. So if you could join us, that'd be great. Wonderful. And thanks again, Luke. Yeah, wonderful. And thanks again to our speakers, and uh, we'll see you at the next event, folks.